Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation where we're gonna look behind the scenes of, oh, of a C++ build system. My name is Josef Wacker. I'm the uh, lead developer or project lead of the Mesen build system. Uh, as a, like a quick show of hands, who here has used it already at some point? Uh, okay, so there's still room for growth for us. Good. Um, so um, this talk is a, a bit special. Um, usually talks are monoliths, they're like one thing, they go through that. Uh, this is not, uh, it's more of a set of independent micro talks uh, uh, about different parts of build system and the things that you need to do to make, make one going. We'll look at uh, optimization, uh, design, dependency management, multi-platform issues, all that good stuff. Uh, now, as a surprise, when I, I was writing this presentation, uh, there were things in that actually surprised me. Uh, it went to places that I didn't predict in any way. Uh, so I hope you will be personally surprised as well. So this is the story number one. Uh, this is a screenshot of a typical uh, Linux desktop, such as the one you might be using. And we're specifically going to talk about this thing here, which is the network, uh, network indicator, which shows you what network you're running. If you click on that, it will show you all of the Wi-Fi connections that you could be ha using. Uh, some years ago, I was in charge of maintaining one of these things uh, for a, a certain Linux distribution. And um, it was an interesting experience. So what happened was that people would start filing bugs. And they would find that, uh, that the network is broken and it's showing things in the Wi-Fi list that are not there. So you need to fix this. This is your problem. And then I said, well, this is not really our problem. We just show what's happening. And the kernel people and the people running the network stack, uh, you should be talking to them. And then everyone said, no, no. This is your responsibility. You have to fix this. OK, fine. So then uh, I filed a bug. I transferred it to the network people. And their response was, if your application is showing some networks that the users don't want to see, it's your responsibility to get rid of it. Won't fix. Uh, and then there was a third thing, which was that uh, we had managers. And then they would start telling me, why are you refusing to fix this? This is going to look bad in your performance review. Uh, and this taught an interesting thing is that whenever you make a problem visible, you get blamed for its existence. Um, you say, you heard the saying, don't shoot the messenger. Well, in reality, the messenger is the first person who will always get shot. Okay, so, but how does this tie into anything? Build systems make a lot of things visible. Uh, a lot of things that people might not even know that are there. So let's take an example. Uh, Invoking a process. This is uh, build systems do this quite a lot. Uh, it seems a simple thing. Like how hard can it be? Well, um, a basic approach for an application that you might want to take is that you have your command that you want to run. You store it in a string array. You have the command. You have the arguments. You can pass them around. Uh, you can go between applications. Have like a JSON string where you have an array and and move around. And eventually you call exec ve which takes a, an array of strings, and then you have your new executable. Uh, and so what's so difficult about it? Well, there's, a, there's an interesting limitation is that on Windows, there is not a process invocation function that takes arrays that actually works. So if you go through MSDN, you will find about five different uh, functions for this, and they all have the wonderful documentation, and at the bottom it says, this function might not do what you expect it to do, but at least it's documented. Uh, what this means is that if you create a tool that in some way deals with uh, process invocation, you have to deal with the fact that commands can be strings, so you have to put them in the strings at some point. And this is the wrong abstraction to take. You really want to have the array all the time, all the way through the system, because that's what the reliable thing is. But it's not. And instead, you get to play the fun game of called the quoting game, which is that first you have your file where you your uh, user types in the command that they run and then to do some quoting to make it actually work. And then you need to quote that string eventually into a, a command.exe uh, command string because that's what Windows actually uses underneath the hood. And then you need to do all the magical quoting, which is more difficult than you would think. Um, and then you, if you're using a ninja to invoke your processes, you need to ninja quote the quoted text. And then if you are on non-Windows platforms, you get to do shell quoting of the same thing, which is uh, also an interesting challenge. Uh, and then you get to ninja quote that shell quote. Uh, but this is not enough. In addition, 
because on Windows, the command uh, art line argument length is quite small, you often need to use response files. So you need to quote uh, the, the response file that you want, and you need the content of the response file first needs to go into the ninja file, so you need to quote that. And then the question is, how do you quote the contents of the response file? What should you use? Well, the answer is that you can't tell. There is no standard for that. It's just the file. Uh, some tools take their command line arguments command quoted on the command line. Some takes them uh, shell quoted when they have a response file. Some have bugs in their response file parses because there is no standard for this. And it's like, is it, is it working or not? Well, you can't tell. But you're thinking, okay, so this, this is an academical exercise. Like, who would really do this, these sorts of things? Um, lots of people, surprisingly. So here's an example from the uh, old make file from GStreamer. Uh, and has all of the wonderful things that you need to pass through the shell. So there's backslash n, the perennial favorite, and you'll, you'll also note that there's a thing that looks like a command uh, a response file thing, because of the at enum, it could be interpreted as a response file in, in, in the middle of your command. And there are quotes that are quoted, and all the wonderful things that you get from there. And these are the things then, then you get to deal with. Now, it could be said uh, that this is not fair towards Microsoft because um, it's just picking on them, and this would be a completely correct criticism. But this is, quite, this is an example. Every single platform has issues like this. Every single tool set has things like this. Apple has it, Linux has them, BSD has them, Android has them, iOS has them, and uh, Linux even has many of them because every single distribution has their own very special thing that they do. And, and so these are the kinds of things that you need to deal with on a database. And most people don't have to do this. So it's, it's really difficult. Like they have no, uh, usually a, a concept of, of how, just how difficult things that seem simple actually are. Um, but let's take it on a different story. So uh, th I think this was in the bingo list that was in, in, uh, posted at some point. Like language S has a thing. Why don't we have that? And this is... Uh, a thing that's common in Reddit. Um, and it could be said that, okay, C++ has a lot of legacy, there's lots of things that, that and we can't chase and so on. Um, but there's actually something a bit deeper than that. Because if you look at C++, C++ and especially C, the, they're very special because they're used to implement the very lowest levels of old stacks. And you, if you have a build system where you want to support that, then you need to be able to support all the special things that happen when you go really, really deep. Uh, and build systems actually divide into two categories. So there's the so-called app build systems, and there's uh, core build systems. And, and the, for building end-user software, you have the app build system, and these are the almost everything. So all of the build systems, people say, that, yeah, that's really great. They're usually, uh, like, almost without exception, they are app build systems, and they, they care about producing end user runnable programs. And, and for core build system, there are really only four systems that are used there. So there's handwritten make files, uh, GNU auto tools, uh, and then CMake and Meson are also used there, but they're, they're like a very small minority. And uh, there are very interesting limitations and things that you, you have to do when you go down there. Uh, the most extreme of them, to, to pick an example, is when you need to bootstrap a new platform, so a new CPU, a new thing that hasn't had any sort of operating system before, then you want to do that. Or maybe you want to build your entire operating system from scratch for various reasons, which we'll go into later. So the way this works uh, uh, for Debian and, and for most other things is that first you cross-compile a very minimal set of tools. You get a minimal install. So you have the shell, you have the compiler, uh, the core libraries uh, make maybe something else. And then and this is the, the important thing. You become self-hosting as soon as possible. And then you compile everything else from there using the, build, the, the core system that you have. Now, the other approach that you could use in this case is that you just cross-compile everything and you don't have to deal with this and then everything works. But there are actually, um, it's very important for philosophical reasons, like being able to build your entire thing from scratch is important. And there are actually legal reasons for this. And, and if, you, if you read the, uh, uh, the trusting trust paper, you will know that there are reasons why you would want to 
build everything from scratch using the tools you control from one CPU architecture to another. The most recently, this has happened with the RISC-V processor, and this work is actually still ongoing. And the extra limitation that you get from this then is that if you are a piece of foundational code or very close to the bottom layers, you cannot use a build system that requires Java, Haskell, or even C++ 17. That's too new. Maybe in a few years, C++ 17 would be accepted there. Uh, Mesin is implemented in Python. Uh, this was already a bit stretching it. The, the people who did the porting were a bit crumpy about it, but like, they accepted it. It was fine. And, and the important thing to note here is that it doesn't matter how good your build system is. It doesn't matter how wonderful it is or what things that it does. Is that if it doesn't support this sort of thing, then the lowest layers of the stack, the people running those things and, and maintaining them, they will not accept it. They was like, no, we cannot use this because this plays too big of a burden for bootstrapping purposes. Uh, and also, this is the, the lenient version of that. So, so you can accept Python. Um, I heard this comment from a BSD developer, and he told me that uh, we can't use, they, they can't use Mesen in their core until it's re-implemented in either C or Perl. And uh, at this point, I would like to quote Meatloaf and say that I would do everything for the users of my software, but I won't do that. So this is uh, a thing uh, which, is, which is quite important. Uh, and onwards, so, so I guess this is what most of you came here to see. So how do you optimize build speeds? And this is an important thing. And it's, it's, there's been surprisingly little research going on on how this should be done. But there are things that we can do. And one of the main things is that uh, you can use shared libraries. And shared libraries are totally awesome. And, and before people uh, come at me with, with pitchforks and things, uh, even if you eventually ship your application in a statically, single static link blob, shared libraries are still totally awesome for the development cycle. And, and the reason for this is that uh, shared linking is faster than static linking because there's less work to do and it's done in sequences. But also, it can make some linking steps completely disappear. Uh, and how does that work? Well, uh, to understand, uh, for this purpose, a shared library uh, is fully specified by the list of symbols that it exports. The contents don't matter, but for the purpose of linking, this is what matters. So what you can do, and this uh, algorithm is originally from uh, Chromium, oops, sorry, um, and as far as I can tell, if someone knows uh, an earlier case, please let me know. So what you do is that you first you build your entire project, and then you extract from each library the list of symbols that it exports. You put it in a file somewhere, and then when you do an incremental build, uh, you extract the list of symbols again. And if it doesn't change, if the list of symbols is the same, you don't have to go any further. All things that would link against this thing continue working. You don't have to do any sort of relinking, and they're just totally fine. And if you have something like you have a library, and then you have 15 test executables, <coughs> sorry, uh, then you just build the library, and you don't have to relink all of the executables. And this is kind of nice. There are some uh, practical problems, but, but pretty much this is how it goes. And, and, and the, the end result is that if you do implementation only changes in your libraries, it's an O1 operation, you, one compile, one link, as opposed to ON, where you relink the world. Uh, right, and uh, so, so some people might say, okay, well, but we have build clusters, we have infinite amount of compute power, and we don't need to do this, we can just do that. Well, this is not actually true, because a build cluster is a throughput optimization. This is a latency optimization, and you can't optimize latency by adding more computers to it. So it's, it's kind of nice, it's usable, usable even in, in these kind of contexts. Um, so as a third kind of thing, which we can talk about, is a design. So how do you design a build system? And uh, perhaps the biggest thing, uh, okay, so in my mind, a build system is how you describe your build. Everything below that is an implementation detail. And the most important design goal in this kind of thing is that uh, do you do a Turing complete uh, language or don't you? And lots of people say, well, I have special needs, I must have this. So let's look at some requirements before that. 
there's a, a law of programmers says that the problem of programmers is that if you give them a chance, they will start programming. And there's a corollary to that, which is that there is no limit to the amount of work a programmer is willing to do to not read documentation. <laughs> so programmers are, they're like problem solving machines. Oh, problem, I'm gonna go solve that. And uh, even though it's, it wouldn't be necessary to actually solve this. And so what does this lead into? So if you have a, uh, something like a Turing complete thing, uh, you have something like this, uh, which, which is a exceedingly scientific thing, which is a graph whose axes don't have units, so you can tell it's scientific. But on the bottom it says, how much work you, have you put in to, on improving your, your thing? And then at the uh, y-axis you have how good the thing is. And if you have a Turing complete thing, it's, it's very easy to get started. If you have anything you don't need, you, can, you don't have, you can just type it yourself and you get your things going. But the thing what happens is that then it slows down and you get into this area here, which is called the Turing tar pit, which is a place where everything is possible, but nothing is easy. I see nodding, I, yeah, you've been there. Uh, and an alternative approach for this is that uh, if you have a non-Turing complete thing where you, have, you can only do certain specific things, then it's a, it's a slow start. You have to learn the thing. Maybe it doesn't do what you need it to do. You need to do like submit changes upstream and all that sort of stuff. But once uh, you get going, then you can take different pieces and put them together and they work really well. And, and the place where the, the lines meet, uh, it could be called place where you need to start cooperating with other people. It's like if you do your own thing and you write your own bespoke thing, it works and you now understand it and everything is fine. But the, uh, software development is a team effort. You need to be able to work with other people. And this is where the, the benefits of having a unified system really start to kick in. Uh, but see, still some people say, like, well, okay, maybe you could do that, but couldn't you add just like a little bit of functions there so you could do this sort of thing? Uh, and the answer we always give to this is no. And the reason is that you can't be just a little bit pregnant and you can't be just a little bit Turing complete. Uh, if it's possible to do something, if you this tree completely somewhere, someone will do it. Uh, no matter how difficult it is, people will go ahead and do it, and there are some people who will view this as a badge of merit. Uh, okay, so the last story uh, I would like to talk about is a dependency management, and, and this is the second most important thing probably you want to see. <coughs> so how do you make dependency management smooth and scalable for big things, because if you have only a few, few libraries, then it's not really such a problem. Um, well, let's look at what, what are the things that have worked thus far. What are the things that have been used and, and have proven that with this sort of mechanism, you can build something huge like a Chrome or something even bigger than that. And there are really only two, two things. So the, this is the classical Unix model. You install everything into a common prefix and you have package config or something similar which provides all the dependency information and then you uh, use the system dependencies to build your thing. And, and this works amazingly well. Uh, the second approach is that you have a single build system, a single repository, all of them in one, one place in one go and then you build from there. And this is uh, like what the Firefox and the Chrome and all these developers are using. Um, nothing else has been proven to work, uh, as far as I can tell. If there's any sort of mixture of these things, uh, it really doesn't work. And it's at, the, at the very least, it's not very pleasant to use. Um, the spe very specific case is that using two different build systems in a single directory where one calls the other does not work, and it cannot be made to work. And, but there are people who really want this to be possible. Sadly, it's not. Uh, this is an entire hour's talk, so you'll just have to believe me or maybe come next year if I'll get accepted to, to have that talk. Uh, but these things have also their problems. Uh, for the approach number one is that if you, have, if you want to have multiple versions of any dependency, then this is a problem because they're in the same file system and eventually you will get them mixed up. Uh, and for approach number two is that the, uh, in order to have that globally, the entire world would need to standardize on a single build system. Now, we all know what this will be, right? But there are some stragglers out there who want to use something else. Um, so, the, so in reality, what will happen is that everything will be awful forever. Right. Except 
Let's think about this a bit further. Let's go back. So the problem with the approach number one was that if you have multiple versions on the same file system, then you get problems. So the obvious follow-up question then is, what if they weren't on the same file system? Is th so is there a mechanism that we can use to isolate file system parts from one another? And it turns out this is now possible. This is a thing called file system namespaces, which is uh, available on Linux uh, for several years now. I'm not sure about well, the kernels of, of, of other operating systems I'm using, but, but uh, on Linux at least this works pretty well. Uh, and so, okay, we, we could separate these different parts of the thing from one another and run things from different places. And uh, again, some people would probably say, hey, ah, this is Docker. He's talking about Docker. Yes, Docker will solve everything. No. So the, the elementary operations that Docker is using, uh, they're very good, and we can use those things to do something slightly different. And one of the things that we can do uh, and, and people have been doing is a, is a thing called Flatpak. And there's a very simple and slightly incorrect description of what Flatpak does is that you, it gives you a root file system where you install all of your dependencies. And when you run the application, it looks to the application as if it's given an entire operating system file system image just for itself. But you can make the user's home directory appear inside of this thing and then you can run it and it will, it's transparent and you can access all the same files that you could otherwise. And you can't tell the difference between running a native application and a flat pack application. Uh, and then if you, if you do some tooling, so there's uh, no builder, it's uh, the first container native IDE, uh, that's the, their nomenclature. And the idea is that uh, instead of having containers, something that you can uh, use during deployment or something, Let's take them and exploit them to the max. And this allows you to do things like this. So here we have a normal Linux operating system install. And there uh, at the top, uh, I've installed Flatpak and GNOME Builder uh, release version from Flatpak. And then I used Flatpak, uh, GNOME Builder, to check out its own source from uh, Git master, build that, and then launch that in a debugger. So we have the release version and the Git version running at the same time on the same user uh, session. And they, they have different dependency versions and they're separated by the kernel and things just work. And if you wanted to, you could do a third one and then a fourth one and a fifth one if, you, if, if that sort of things appeals to you. So you can do all sorts of cool things. And the best part about this is that you can do all of this without using the command line even once on Linux. I kid you not. Uh, and it gets even better. So if you look at the Flatpak manifest file, this is roughly what it looks like. You say that, okay, I have a basic runtime and then extra dependencies that you need and they, they're installed in the standard uh, Unix build way. And then you get this thing and then you install your own software on top of that. So is your computer science sense tingling now? Because it should. This is fully deterministic and this is fully cacheable. Just, just this file completely uniquely identifies the image. So if you have a cloud build environment, you can pre-build this image with all of the dependencies that you would ever need, put it there, and then have people de uh, develop on that, and they only have to compile their own code. <coughs> Excuse me. And it works just as if you had installed all the things in their system, except that it's fully isolated from everything else. Um, and, and there's other good news. So if you have a reliable distributed file system, uh, for the record, not NFS, I tried that and it doesn't work, then it's, it's trivial to parallelize your build because uh, in a traditional way, you can't just send your executables out to be run somewhere else because the, the things that are installed on that machine may be completely different. But if you have a standardized image and you have the same file system, which is visible on all of them, then it's trivial. You can run all of your compiles on any machine that you want. Uh, you can run your links. You can run your test. You can run any executable that you want, uh, assuming that, that uh, the build system takes care that you don't run things so that uh, the things that depend on each other are running at the same time. Um, now this is the, the fourth story that I have. So let's see if we can bring all of this together. 
uh, and answer the question, which uh, is, is the perennial question, is why have build systems been so terrible? Um, yeah, so let's, 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 let's go through the things. So they sur surface a lot of problems that are there in the underlying systems. Um, they have to solve problems. So they specifically build systems for so C++ and other low-level <coughs> languages. Is that they have to solve problems that other languages don't have and that and other languages are not solving. And in order to make a C++ build system that is generally accepted, it has to do this. But for other languages, they don't really have to do that. Uh, they can't use functionality that, that other languages other languages have. You have to be very constrained if you want to be able to support things like bootstrapping and so on. Uh, there have been they have not traditionally been subject to optimization, and and I suspect there's uh, still some performance on the floor which you could use uh, to to make builds faster. But traditionally, this is not an area where people have worked, uh, and there's a short-term thinking um, driving people to cheering tar pits because usually people, what they want to do is to get stuff done quickly. And this uh, selection pressure is towards selecting things <coughs> where you can change things at, at whim rather than those which, where you have to do some extra work up front to make things work. Because uh, build system selection is usually not something where you spend weeks on. It's just like, I need to make something happen now. Let's go with this. And perhaps most importantly, um, we found that uh, we have, as a, like, as, as a whole, we've been trying to implement a kernel space construct entirely in user space. Uh, so the separation of applications and dependencies from each other has been done entirely in user space. Uh, static linking is one of way that you can do this. It's like, let's put all the things here so it's separated from everything else. Um, and as, just like you can't implement a mutex in user space, you can't really do a proper uh, dependency separation in user space, you need to use the kernel for that. But now we have all the tooling and all the pieces together for it, and I, now I think we can uh, solve this underlying problem properly, and then uh, build system will actually become, they have to do less, and they become simpler, and they become usable. And uh, as they say, the rest is implementation. Thank you very much. So if you have questions, please line up at the mic. Uh, the three, first three people to ask a question will receive one of these. So be quick. Oh, there's one. Hi. First of all, thanks very much for the talk. That was I learned, learned really a lot. Um, I have a question regarding this. Um, I was er very interested in this um, optimizing the link step that right. you mentioned that was done in Chromium. Right. So the question is, how much of that is possible to do in the build system um, um, and not in the build system generator? So th is that something that is supported by Ninja or is it something that is support where the support comes from Mason? So Ninja by itself doesn't support that. Okay. So in Meson, what we do is that we have a, a wrapper script which runs after the link and it extracts the list and puts it in a file and then we do some Ninja ma magic to have the dependency on the actual file and not the SO file that gets generated. Okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Come get yours. All right, excellent. Can you, yeah, can you elaborate on the issues you had with NFS? Okay, so the problem with NFS that I had was that um, if you run a, a compile step on one machine and generates an a dot object file, and then the it re so it returns. Uh, I wrote a blog post about it, so you can find the details there. But the point is that when it, it comes back, and then you invoke a linker on a different machine, and even if the, even if you run fsync on the one file on where, where the object file is generated. When you start the link, sometimes it will say this file doesn't exist. 
Oh, thanks. Um, so, uh, what was the driving decision behind using Python to implement Meson when um, bootstrapping and uh, you know that kind of cross compatibility was a huge concern? Uh, so, uh, so Python is extremely ex extremely cross platform. It makes a lot of things which are really difficult go away. And Python is also a very productive language, especially for this uh, in the first beginning stages. Um, it was mostly because that's what I knew the best. Um, I knew from the beginning that this might be uh, like, a, like an issue. Um, but what, I, what I'm hoping for is that um, Perl will eventually die and, and people will accept that Python won and then this will stop being an issue. Thanks. So you're the last one to win. Okay, I kind of noticed that you uh, uh, advertised Gnome Builder. Do you use it yourself? It's the first time someone is actually advocating that. Uh, so I've only used it for testing. So I'm, I'm a bit eccentric. I use Eclipse, and I like using Eclipse. So, uh, And the reason I use Eclipse is for, because it has all of the languages in once. And it's, it's like if you need to swap between languages, it works really nicely for that. Uh, but I've been looking into using all different sorts of IDEs every now and then. I'll probably have a better look at Gnome Builder soon. Okay, so uh, I was told that we can go a minute or a few over time, so go ahead. Uh, can you give an example for features that are Turing complete or non Turing complete uh, in the build in, system? It, so, in, in Meson or in something else? General. So, in, in general, uh, if you can express an arbitrary calculation, it's Turing complete. If it's possible to write an, a de an infinite loop, then it's Turing complete. And in Meson, neither of these are possible. Okay. So the slide with the uh, flat pack specification, I saw that and I was thinking to myself, this is starting to look like a Palm XML from Apache Maven. Are there lessons learned from other build systems? Um, okay, so um, what I recommend that you do is that you look up the actual manifest file and what the format of that is. This is just a thing that I condensed so it fits in the on slide. Um, but you can do things like you can specify compiler flags and you can specify um, patches and so on. So, like, so it's a very, uh, it's a good format for what it does. And, and the, one of the nice things is that you don't have to rewrite the build system of everything that you have just to use it. You can just use its own thing and it will install and, and then you don't have to care about that anymore. Okay, thanks. Okay, so if there are no more questions, um, I think it's break time.